So the first thing we're going to do is um, a little self-reflection exercise, um, which is basically starting with um, looking at how we are. Um, and so I think the um, a good way to do this, does everyone have something to write on and with? Okay. Um, so just for yourself, you're not going to be sharing this with anyone, um, but just do a little bit of um, like really tuning in to how you are so that you, in the same way that you would ask a good friend who you really care about, who's maybe been having a hard time, um, but not in a creepy way. How are you? <laughs> um, so the idea here is um, just to look uh, like, and to recognize that most people who are at the stage of graduate studies that you are, are um, fairly damaged by the process that has gotten you to where you are. Also quite strong, um, but just to be a little bit like, yeah, I mean, it's great if you're doing good, um, but you can just write down some descriptions of how you're feeling. So that's the first piece. Um, say, hello, how am I? Um, if you're getting really stuck on that, you can say, um, if I were a board game, I would be risk. If I were a piece of fruit, I would be, right? So you can also get metaphorical if you're like, I don't know how I am. Um, but we'll just take sort of two minutes and be like, how am I? So you can keep reflecting on those things, um, but next, just write a couple of um, can be bullet points <coughs> about just describing when you write, how you write, what time of day, um, after what, before what, um, what's your state of mind.
So what's a time or context where writing has felt fluid and um, easy and where you've been sparked and felt alive in your own writing process? When, when does that happen or has that happened for you? So if you want to cue for this, <laughs> Christina says, in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're asking us to share. Um, for those of you who are just starting the process, I took one of Carlton's writing boot camps where it's, it's you know, um, four hours a day in the morning. And so the first half hour, you meet in a little group and you decide what your goals are and then you write for three hours and then you come together at the end. And one of the things that they very um, highly suggested was actually that you don't write when you feel like writing. Yep. The best writing is when you schedule time. And so for a while after that, I did writing and I did it based on a time and I had to fight my supervisor. Fight's maybe a harsh word, but say, no, you can't schedule our lab meetings during my writing. Um, and the ex example given was if you have a job, you may you go to your job. You don't go, well, I don't feel like going to my job. And I got my best writing done when I did that. Um, and I did it for until I got my prospectus done. And then once I did that, there was a lack of support for continuing that. And so when you say my writing now, I, I actually realize I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of other stuff other than writing. And this has made me aware that I need to figure out how to get that writing block scheduled back in where I say no to everybody. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In fact, yeah. So anyway, yeah. my writing most creative is on a schedule, actually. Yeah. So, so, so just like anything like that, just, and we're going to do a little bit more harvesting, but just if there's anything that you're like, yes. So Eve also says that agreeing with how helpful the writing workshops are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So then conversely, also just make notes. When do things feel impossibly hard? When is it not, when are you like, I am not writing? What's happening there? What's the, what are the conditions? Okay, so, so we're gonna sort of do, we're doing this, then we're gonna put it in the background for a little bit, and then in part four, thinking about some of the sort of writing techniques and tips for working on stuff. Um, and so, especially also if folks are like, I'm actually, don't need any tips and things like that, you can leave, you can leave any time and I will not be personally hurt, just so everyone knows this is like totally consensual workshopping situation. Mm -hmm. um, Except, except I'm the talking one with the plan, so. All right, so um, internally managing, so I'll just say right now, part of what your job is now is to have a clear understanding of how you actually are, when you feel alive, and when you feel um, stuck and blocked. Um, and to be just <clears throat> in a kind of open way asking, how can I set my life up in such a way that I don't spend the next year um, just uh, silently screaming into the void. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, a lot of us when we're finishing a big project basically turn to the people that love and support us and say, you cannot expect me to be a normal um, person until I'm done with this. I will never be able to be 
I'm present with you. I will always be having a hard time. You can never ask me how the writing's going. Um, don't expect anything from me. So one thing to know at the beginning of the year that you're finishing is that this isn't actually an acceptable way to run your life. Um, <laughs> it, it's not gonna work well. And it's, it's not good for you or for them. So, um, so one thing that we know is that you are not actually gonna work on the dissertation 24 hours a day. Um, that there's lots and lots of data about the importance and wisdom of having endpoints to your workday, about meaningfully taking time off, um, about really having a clear sense of when you're working and when you're not working. And a thing that I hope all of you can sort of own or, or feel is that if you approach this next year as though it's a sprint, you're not going to actually finish the dissertation, you're just going to burn out. So you really need to think about this as a long-term, slow and steady situation, even though you're experiencing it as something that has to happen kind of fast. So there's a kind of interesting flip that happens there in terms of this. So in terms of relating to other people, um, I actually invite you to talk to the people that are your close folks. So your good friends, your housemates, your lover, your partner, your kids, um, whatever state, you know, whatever way it is to talk to them, to just try to get a sense of what they actually need from you in that role. So you are going to be asking them to make accommodations for how weird you're going to get. Um, but people can make those accommodations when they have some sense that their basic needs from you are met. So like this could be that you commit, sometimes they won't be able to tell you actually what they mean, but you can know that if you can't tell them that there's a time when you're actually going to be present and available with them, um, that that's not going to be something that they can sustain for a long time. So you can independently say to your, your people, um, I am working today until 630 and then I am available to rot watch, you know, reruns of Nashville. I don't know what you're watching. <laughs> uh, so like, or I'm right. I'm going to, I'm working all week, but I'm taking Sunday completely off. Um, and we can do whatever you want, or I can go grocery shopping at this time. So this is a, um, a thing that I just encourage you to do that, um, the, a way to ask it, it's okay for you to be being selfish as you're finishing the dissertation, but is to sort of look at it as how can supporting the people close to you help your process? So that if you're able to recognize what they need from you as sort of basic friendness, basic partnerness or parent or whatever, that's actually going to allow them to give you space to do the work that you need to do. So setting up a clear understanding of what the basic, basics are is really um, good for that. And that allows them to be wholehearted in saying, no, it's good. I'll do the laundry right now. You go do your units of writing. Um, I support you because they know that they're not gonna be doing, doing the laundry every day for the entire time. Or like, I'll do the laundry right now, and I hear that you're gonna do it when you take your day off your work, and I believe that you're actually gonna do that. So you can make commitments to the people close to you, and that lets them um, trust you. Part of what you're committing to is taking breaks from the dissertation, which is also really good for you. Okay, so, um, so this is a post-workshop task look at the people close to you. I actually encourage you to write down who you, the people are, who are supporting you are and just actually in a really real way, think about what they need from you in that role and whether you can give it right now. Um, so it's also might be that if you have someone who's like, what I need from you is to be available for hour long, really emotionally intense phone conversations every day there might be people that you're like, I am not gonna be able to do that for you. I'm sorry, I wish I could be the friend that could be there for you in that way, and that's not what I can do if I'm gonna finish this dissertation. You don't need to feel bad about it, right? You can be honest. Okay, so C, supervisors and committee. So I think this would be good if we, um, I actually feel like maybe it would be what my thought was to share a little bit how your supervisors actually work. Um, but if that feels too 
fraught or vulnerable, we don't have to do it that way. We can do it just in the way you did your thinking about yourself. Um, but this is sometimes good for people to hear what actually happens. So, um, so I thought we could spend just like less than like five to 10 minutes. Um, just if there's anything you want to popcorn out about what actually happens when you have a meeting with your supervisor, when you give them a draft of something, um, when they pay attention to the draft that you gave, gave them, when they don't. Um, yeah, I would just say that like, it can be good. I've heard a lot of stories of people that don't get along with the supervisor, but have a um, healthy chemistry. Uh, but I work with Randall Germain, and he has been he listens so closely when we're in meetings, and it's time, a reasonable amount of times. He, he gives very positive and encouraging feedback on the work that I pass over to him. And sometimes I, I do feel the need, because he's very positive, to say, like, okay, so like, what did you not like about it? Like, really dig into that. Uh, and he, and he, he definitely is, is up to doing that. He's very, he explains himself very well, which is great. And he's also a proactive committee member that helps our hands. Okay. I, I don't mean to, I just feel like I have to. Right. So you just lucked out and without doing anything, your supervisor is awesome. That's great. What have you done? Okay. So you meet, meet the deadlines that you set together. Mm -hmm. So you give him writing and he actually responds. Do you initiate setting up meetings or does he? I initiate setting up meetings, and yeah, I have to very self-guided in my field research. Um, so that is a point of response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other folks? Um, my supervisor is also generally quite great. Um, she's very blunt, which huh? is good. And I think just from already talking about this, I'm thinking about how I need to approach her and ask what things are going to get in her way this year because I know she'll tell me like just over the summer I've learned that she really feels like academics for the most part need to be left alone during the summer so that's a really good thing to know because if I plan to defend next summer but she feels like that's her time to get her work done then I might need to push forward some timelines and so I'm realizing now I need to check in mm -hmm. on that stuff and I think also I, I tend to check in and make sure she's received files and stuff but there have been a couple times where she really like received something and would have gotten back to me in time but just completely forgot and like not in a way where she would be upset if i reminded her but i do need to just like we always need to set timelines and then we remind her because i think we need to i need to realize that for me this is my entire life and for everyone on my committee it's one of 30 things that they're juggling yeah. <laughs> so that's a very generous way to talk about it <laughs> so you know one thing is I mean, that's a, and I think I can see that as a very, um, like, workable way to think about it, right? And there also is this feature, like, I've been, I hear from students in my role whose supervisors have, like, never responded to a draft, yeah. right? Yeah. And, like, and the student is, like, I think it must be that I'm stupid and they don't like me, but they don't know how to break up with me. And, you know, and for me, it's, like, this is like people are actually getting paid a tremendous amount of money and this is our job and and there's like we're supposed to give feedback within two weeks um and often we don't so like ryan <laughs> has the experience of i'm on ryan's committee <laughs> he passed a, something in we were having in in december we had a meeting and ryan was it in july you don't have to say june or july none of us remembered receiving it. None of us had responded to him at all. He was in a class with me. <laughs> I was talking about his writing all the time, right? So there's this sort of fact that's like, okay, how are we gonna deal with this is a real thing about many supervisors? Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a question about managing up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I definitely did luck out. I think the supervisor is wonderful and so attentive and committed to my success, um, which puts a lot of pressure on me because I don't mm -hmm. want to disappoint her. Um, also, she gives so much feedback 
endless feedback. Uh, Maybe seven comments feedback. We're way past that. <laughs> <laughs> One draft I got back has turned into a comment. Not even just like deletions and insertions or things that she writes into the text in capitals. Keep those on good. Um, so there's so much. Um, uh -huh. I, you know, I'm a writing coach for undergraduate engineers, and I have this problem too where I want their work to be good, and I start to um, write things into my in my voice, or I want it to be perfect, but like my voice and my idea of a finished piece as a PhD student in social sciences, and what a first year engineering paper needs to be are radically different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I would really like to. You know, I'm so grateful for your feedback, but I have an article that I would like to send out that it's, I feel like it's 99.9% .9 done and then I don't even give it to her and get 89 comments back. I need to convey to her somehow the difference between stylistic feedback and things that are like critically wrong. Yep. And also sometimes when she rewrites things in her voice, then I feel like it's not my article. I also, I think, have this problem with my reading that earlier. Sometimes I look at feedback that she was giving me, and it just seems like stylistic patterns and that kind of stuff. What I see, I just want to ignore it and like actually take the notes and actually work. That was this idea of my own, what my justifications for this kind of thing is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is that's an interesting discussion. Uh, right, so if you're a supervisor, you're teaching courses, you're doing a lot of research like that. How important is supervising a student? How important are we in, in their workflow? Mm. And also, what you just brought up, what happens if you want to ignore a piece of advice from your supervisor? Are they going to remember it once? You know, unless you yeah. that later? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so, just for the computer folks, um, and Vivian, I see that you have a going to say something. Um, so just to say what, so um, supervisors that give very, very uh, enormous n amounts of comments, numbers of comments, like 349 comments, or have like really a lot of comments that are basically about stylistic things, and then a question of like, in a professor's life, how important actually are their grad students? So I think it varies a lot. Um, and supervisors have a whole range of ways that they relate to grad students. So some are um, extremely hands-on and have like this level of commenting where you're changing the tone of a, t of a sentence. And some have this kind of approach that's like, I believe in free range chickens and grad students. <laughs> and, you know, come back to me when you've eaten enough maggots and you're full of protein so I can eat you. Um, something happened there with the, uh, so that you can anyway so one of the things that I think um, you kind of know that about the kind of supervisor you have and hopefully there's a good fit right there's hopefully there's a good um, match between being someone who for example likes to finish a whole draft of something before you turn it in and get feedback or being someone who likes to get feedback as you go along um, but not always and so then there's this question of how to um, bring yourself into focus in, in terms of the kind of person you are. Sometimes also you've changed and they don't know. They can't tell that you're a different, a different person than you were four years ago when you started working with them, where maybe it was great to have 300 comments on a chapter, and now you're someone who has more of your own ballast and you don't need that from them anymore. So, um, so I would say it varies greatly um, how faculty attend to students. But I don't know, even the faculty members who I now know in my department are not responding to their students. I know that internally they feel that they care about their students, want them to do well, and um, believe in them. And so even the faculty who are the people that um, students tell me things and they feel really hurt by a way that their faculty member has been, or feel like I, there are students in our department who leave you know, like know all the different hallway tricks, the low building has many of them, <laughs> so that if you hear your supervisor coming, you don't encounter them. Um, so, uh, so the question is, whatever relationship you have, how can this moment be a time to 
be like, I need you to be more responsive and present with me now, or I need you to let me have my own space and voice now. And one of the techniques that I advocate for is the memo, um, where you tell the supervisor or the committee member um, what stage of draft this is at. I can send you a version of this, but it's basically this. What is this? Have they seen it before? Um, what feedback did they give you on the last version that they saw? How have you responded to it? What kind of feedback are you looking for now? So in this, you, the way that you focus them is you say, um, this is a first draft of this chapter. This is a second draft of, of this chapter. Supervisor has read it and signed off on sending it to you. I am looking for um, big level assessment of how the argument of this chapter works. The argument as I see it is, I am trying to show that this literature relates to this literature in this way in order to stage my um, results, which I'll be reporting in the next chapter. Here's the table of contents for the dissertation. Um, I am not looking for sentence level feedback on this draft. So, or um, this, uh, you have all read this, the committee has all signed off on it. I am now looking for if there are any details that would cause you to not feel comfortable putting this version forward to defense. So it's basically the memo that you give them situates them in terms of what you are doing um, and asks them specific questions. So the vague supervisors who don't say anything frequently can be cued to say something if you ask them a question because academics like to answer questions. Let me explain that to you. Um, the too prolific supervisor, if you say, um, I need to know what the things are that would cause you to block this going forward to defense, um, can sometimes rein themselves in a little bit. Um, or if you say, I'm only looking for a quick read of this, right, it can be, or you've given detailed feedback on this and this, I have made these changes. So these are ways to sort of corral them. Um, and then depending on your relationship with the supervisor and the committee member, you can say, um, I feel really like it's so mm -hmm. generous, the, and I'm also frequently, I notice that I feel overwhelmed by the level of detail of comments that you're giving me. Um, like, yeah. I have a very specific question that might, surely doesn't apply to anyone else, but um, I, um, I'd actually, I've written to you before and I, um, you sent me your memo um, and I use it when I suggest to you uh, that other people use it if it's possible. Um, my supervisor, I've known her for um, going on 12 years. She, she was like my first year seminar instructor in arts one. So she's known me for such a long time, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to change the way we interact yeah. now. By, right. The I memo might not be enough. I know it. Or I just don't know if she would take that seriously. I feel like she might be like, what is like, uh -huh. Did you get this in your workshop? <laughs> 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 uh, like I have the memo and I would love to use it, but I just can't see how that would work. Like, I feel really entrenched in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Does this resonate with other people? Yeah. Well, I mean, not necessarily entrenched in a relationship, but no other students use a memo, and so suddenly introducing it into a lab where everybody else is known as status quo. Mm -hmm. um, similar. Yeah. Do you potentially just try it? Is it a big deal? Is it just an email? Hey, that's what's going on. It just helps me clarify my ideas as a tool. Some, sorry, some supervisors who do writing workshops and they discourage their students from attending those things. They think that their time's better spent writing. So um, if you have a supervisor like that, which I do, and you're not, you know, you're not going as well. So. Or don't use the format of the memo, but use the content. So I probably wouldn't use the memo, but I like the way that you suggested. Hey. Camouflage the memo. Camouflage the memo. Yeah. yeah, I mean, any other? 
I think you're man you're managing your supervisor to a certain extent. When I interviewed my supervisor, I did actually ask some of the questions about you know what I you know managing me and some of the challenges involved in managing me, and also the other way around, what do they need from me? I don't think the I never found that I've got a satisfactory answer and one that I fully believe when I've asked this question, but. Um, I at least feel like I've given them an opportunity to understand what I think I need from them. Yeah. But I often find the process, um, it's not always clear to me who's in charge of the sort of structure of things. And so it can be sometimes a bit of a delicate balance. I find my supervisors overly passive. And so I'm often trying to sort of hand over something and uh, find myself just kind of setting the structure, but I think I see it working. Yeah. And you never can tell how people are going to respond to things. So um, mostly supervisors get no training in how to supervise students. And as academics frequently are not good at um, learning how to do something that we're not good at. In fact, like many academics are used to fronting as a mode of being and being really outraged if someone tells us that we're not doing something um, good, especially when it's something that we're spending a lot of energy and time on. So to a certain extent, the passive supervisor is easier to work with because the passive supervisor you, or the passive committee member, you simply say, um, please let me know if you have any feedback by this date. Um, if I don't hear anything from you, I and my supervisor, I and the rest of the committee will assume that you're comfortable with this going to defense. So like non-response. So the, the over engagement can be trickier because the passive person there's a lot there's always going to be one person on your committee who doesn't actually read your dissertation but you can set things up so that i know it's ridiculous you can set things up so at least they don't block it and they're too embarrassed by the time they get to the defense to tell you that they didn't actually read it and they just like ask a couple of questions based on what the external asked them you know it's like but but this is more difficult and so when you've had a long relationship with someone, it might be possible to have a frank conversation where you say, thank you so much for our conversation yesterday. I went to this workshop and I've realized that one of the things that I need to figure out is how to work with the quantity of, of generous comments that you're giving me, um, you know, in order for me to get to the next stage, you know. And maybe I can say that everyone's if it goes to her and I get feedback, yeah. So many back, but then it goes to a bunch of other people, and maybe they don't get feedback. That's still that's still really a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So right. So saying like I'm thinking of starting to use this technique of this memo. What do you think of that? Are you comfortable with me doing that with you? We have this long history together. For the person on your committee who's more junior and um, they, they might just not know the a sort of normal number of comments to give. Um, so sometimes it can work to be like, um, my supervisor says that he is comfortable with this moving to defense. I am interested in your expertise in this particular way. You've been very generous with feedback and I just want to be clear that I don't need you to read this in huge detail, right? Like, so there can be some subtle ways to cue. Um, and then I think that that question what here do I need to change in order for you to feel comfortable bringing this to defense? Um, that's sort of like the moment where often people will be like, oh no, like that's for the book project. I don't need you to change that. Um, but if you do have some version of the memo where you're saying, these are the things that I altered in response to your feedback last time. I think that's what I'll do. I'll send her a list of notes. This is what I responded to. These are the things that I need to refresh just so that you have the same mind that you think that you might yeah. 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 I mean, the baseline for managing the supervisor and committee's expectations is communicating. Like, there's so that thing where I was like, you get this mountain like dignity of your own ballast. There's this thing that also happens to your supervisor and your committee where they're like, oh, you're finishing this year. Okay. This is what needs to happen. And so there's a change also that's a difference between like, what might this dissertation project be to like, okay, if we're gonna actually get this done, what needs to really happen? Um, which is why in the timeline, um, I'm saying like, 
six months before the defense date, you need to be communicating to the supervisor and the committee members that you're really planning to finish. But actually, like, it's good to start doing that now for finishing in a year. Um, or in your case, you're <laughs> finishing in a couple of months, so they know this. And they should actually start being a little bit more realistic. Okay, do you want to spend a little bit of time writing about or talking any more about supervisors? Or does everyone feel um, there's some good comments on the chat um, about having a supervisor who's about to retire versus being the first PhD supervisor, supervisee for another person. Um, and that this quality of feeling like sometimes the committee has too much faith that you're keeping it together and you know what you're doing. And I think that that's, I have heard that from a lot of people and I definitely experienced that as a student. Like I said to my supervisor, I think you think that I'm like a mountain goat who can just, you know, eat the scraggly grasses. And he was like, I do think that about you, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, that is a real thing. So managing up, managing them. Um, we're about to log out of the 40 minute. So let's just take a quick break again. Does everyone wanna stretch and walk around a little? Okay, so see you all in a little minute, onlineers.